As you set out for Ithaca, hope your journey is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Istragonians and Cyclops, wild Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You won't find things like that on your way if you keep your thoughts held high, if a rare excitement strikes your body and your spirit. Lastragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, you'll only find things like that or encounter things like that if you bring them along inside your soul, if your soul holds them up in front of you. Hope your journey is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when, with what pleasure, what joy, you come into harbours seen for the first time and visit many Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl, coral, ambony and ebony, amber and ebony. But don't hurry the journey at all. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for, wealthy with all that you've experienced on the way. But if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wealthy with experience, you'll know by then, with your wisdom, what all these Ithacas mean. These lines are reminiscences of Ithaca, a poem from Constantin Cavafy, which inspired the title of his documentary. Can we talk about your contact with Julian through his childhood? It's part of the story, I think. It isn't important. part of the story. Yeah. The story is that, I, you know, I am attempting in my own modest way yeah. to get Julian out of the ship. Julian Assange is the hero of our time. He was the darling of the left. All of a sudden, he's a puppet of Russia. My name is John Shipton. I'm Julian Assange's yeah, father. WikiLeaks found that Julian Assange has been arrested. One of the most notorious and controversial figures in custody. Assange will remain behind bars until that extradition hearing, which has been set down for the end of February. I urge the Department of Justice to drop the charges. The maximum jail sentence of 175 years. Because he published the truth. How does it feel to be the father of such a controversial figure, somebody who's known around the world? Was that him on the phone before? Yeah. 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 What are you talking about on a, on a kind of regular basis? If Julian is extradited to the United States to face these charges, he will be the first, but not the last. What are your worst fears? That it just collapses under the strain. It looks as though what journalists do for a living is seen to be a criminal act. Oh, yeah, no. Shit, keep it up, man. Thank you. I wish I had your energy. I really do. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I mean, I'm fucking out. Why do you think there's not a great public love and support? This is really, a, truly, a good question. What's at stake? If he goes down, so will journalism. But if people walked away from this film understanding you, how would you feel about that? We're here, and this has only come about because we have a child in the ship mm. and we want to get him out. Hello. I'm Nadia from the Julian Assange Support Committee in France. On the occasion of the release of the movie Ithaca, directed from Ben Lawrence, we invite you to meet John Shipton, who was in Paris in September 23. Bonjour, John. May I ask you to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. My name is John Shipton. I'm from Australia. Uh, I'm Julian Assange's father. and. I'm here in France with uh, Jean-Paul Redet and Genevieve Maclot and uh, 
Victor Lelage and several others uh, at the uh, fate of the humanities or the festival of the humanities where uh, Ithaca was shown just the other day and we did uh, after Ithaca a Q&A where well, I might say that the audience was very appreciative and gave us uh, a standing ovation. In fact, they wouldn't sit down. We had to ask them to stop and sit down. Otherwise, we'd call the fire brigade. How did the movie all started? Well, it, uh, people just turned up with a camera, like now, with uh, Nadia and Isabella. They just came with a camera. And wherever I went, they followed me. So for two, a little over two years. Ithaca is a movie about Julian Assange very different from Hacking Justice. Hacking Justice is, uh, has distinct aims of its own, um, whereas uh, the aims of Ithaca, uh, as far as I can tell, were to uh, accompany me on a journey, whereas uh, Hacking Justice tells a story which has a beginning, a middle and end. You know. Whereas the Ithaca just is a journey. How was it for you to be part of a documentary movie? <laughs> well, I don't think I had any choice. <laughs> they just came, you know, it was my son. What am I, I can't say go away. Because he's my son, uh, they and he came with the camera and and uh, some enthusiasm and some tenderness. Uh, so I, what can I do? I, I just say yes, uh, okay, away we go. The movie starts with this idea: as Julian Assange can speak for now, you, his family, friends, you have to speak for him. Well, yes, do you want me to answer that or... Ex uh, um, well, that seems, you know, obvious because he's in maximum security prison and held incommunicado. That is, like the Alexander Dumas story, the man in the iron mask in the Bastille, where he had to wear the mask well, and not be seen. Well, Julian is in the same position, no different. Where are we now in the case for Julian? Where are we now? In the case, in the legal matter, well, we await a decision by the High Court of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom uh, it's the High Court, that means England and Wales and Northern Ireland. The Supreme Court of the United Kingdom would be, include Scotland, okay. It doesn't include Scotland, it's the High Court. And they make a decision as if, as to if Julian can appeal. They say, yes, you can appeal, or no, you can't appeal. If it says, no, you can't appeal, then they must go to the European Court of Human Rights. And this uh, very much, of course, concerns France. Do we know when? No, they take their own time. Uh, you know, they have to have some red wine and go to the club make a discussion over the Times newspaper and so on. This is apparently how judges come to a decision. This is part of their kind of reality, their kind of ordinary life. Yeah, maybe it's better to see these things through the lens of poetry rather than the lens of prose and profanity. Julian revealed the truth to the world. But did he really have the choice? When you have this level of consciousness, is it possible to hide it? To stay silent? Did he have the choice? 
Well, you know, we say, we can say that r real meditation is a choiceless land. If your meditation is deep and close to your soul, you will find that there is no choice available to you. The real meditation would measure all of the world, not just your desires. So you would make your fit into the world perfect. So there is no choice. That may be answer your question. We could go another way if you like. Um, that we could follow Point Kier as we're in France. And he says that in a determined system, a small perturbation can cause a large variation. So if you take a human being as a determined system, you are born, you age and you die. This is a determined system. But within that, a small variation, a small perturbation, say you decide to take Lewis Bunuel, you know, if you, so you decide by accident, you drop something in the kitchen and you become late for an appointment. So you take a taxi instead of going on the bus. And in the taxi, you may, the driver is from Algeria and he's particularly beautiful. And so you make, and you say, hello. And there, some time after, you uh, marry and have children. If you had not dropped the coffee on the floor in the kitchen, you wouldn't have married. So this may be how it is in life. Huh? How do you know which turn, left or right, led you to the present? If you'd have gone right, you may be in another place now, but you went left. In the movie, you shall reiterate your interest in building houses. You love homes. You know, the house contains, you know, all the theatre of life. And it's the stage upon which we play. Homer said that to offer hospitality is sacred. So in the house, in the home, we can offer hospitality and we can embrace the sacred through a simple thing like being in our own. Once in India, many years ago, I was doing some yoga and a man completely crippled, he would walk on his hands, his legs didn't work at all. And he was there, you know, this big, and he'd walk on hands. I was there for some weeks and each day he would see me coming and so I'd cross the road because I knew he wanted money. But I played the game. So for two weeks, I crossed the road and he watched me and watched me. And on the last day I was there, I stayed on the side of the road and he came up and he said, I was waiting for you. And I said, well, here I am. And I gave him some money. And he said, well, will you take food with me? I said, okay. And we walked down dirt, you know, not nice. And his house was a piece of uh, cardboard like this. Only this big because he's only this tall, you know. His house is cardboard like that. And he got a cup and offered me some of food and I sat on the ground and 
you know, shared the hospitality. So you don't need much of a house. But say the bedroom must be quiet but sensual. Uh, and the living room have a place of contemplation, meditation and comfort, just ordinary comfort. The kitchen, of course, is where you prepare sustenance, which keeps you alive. So you follow in the kitchen ritual, like a religious ritual. You put on the kettle in the morning, you grind the coffee, you smell the aroma coming up when you grind the coffee, and then you take I, the milk, if you like, cafe au lait, you warm the milk, and then you get the croissant, you take off a bit and you dip it in the coffee, and voila, this is a religious ceremony which sustains you in life, without which you're in the cemetery. So that's the house. And also, uh, the pleasure uh, of washing oneself. There's a line in, uh, in Shakespeare's Macbeth which goes like this. Is there not rain enough in all the sweet heavens to wash this blood from my hand? So we see... Mm, when we wash, we cleanse here and here, but also in here, we cleanse a little bit of the soul. You said you are traveling to build up coalitions of friendship. Is it a kind of house with non-visible walls? I suppose so, but maybe the better image is, uh, you know, because it's nomadic. Nomadic. The, the Im better image is a large tent. Yeah. And you open the tent and come in. And then you pack up the tent and go to Paris, and then you go to London, and Berlin, and, and Basel, and you know, Zurich, and then Geneva, and blah, blah, and down to Italy, and so on. On and on it goes. But each time you unfold the tent and you bring people in. Sometimes the tent gets very big. But mostly I find that the tent is distinct and has its own quality and characteristics. So in Paris or France, it has about seven people in the tent uh, and other places, and they have a distinction, you know, uh, and their character and their vigor their insights into life and their intellectual power. And it's the same in Berlin, but it's distinct with its own character. So in Berlin, they talk, but they like the written word. In Paris, they prefer conversation and the written word, but it's even. But in Berlin, the written word is slightly more. In the United States, they are visual people, so uh, they like visual stimulus more than written stimulus. So it's visual and spoke spoken word. The written word comes last, and so on. In Australia, there's a, a, a modernist society like America, Canada, and New Zealand. So the 
rituals of culture are a little more um, unpolished. Um, yeah. In Australia, in modernist societies, uh, um, you know, there's not so, the, the layers aren't so distinct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you follow that? No, not the last line. Huh? Well, the layers? the layers of society. Here in France, the, the, is the oldest Western state, a thousand years old. So, it, it, what you have here is distinct. You have a, a, a deep, you know, culture extending back many years with considerable achievement. And this inhabits the soul of French people in a distinct way. Some people say, uh, they used to say, that France has an excellent polity people, but poor politicians. Uh, um, in England they say the opposite. The characteristic of England is a, an impoverished people and a very skilled establishment. It's in I don't know if it's still hold true. Probably it's not any true anymore. Julian Assange's case in France reveals how tricky political links or games are. How do you see that in Australia? Well, I, I, I just depend upon my guides, you know, an instinct. Um, yeah, so I depend upon... Uh, we have a, a supporter uh, Francois, we call him the bulldozer. He's <laughs> he's a he's a Gaullist. So from him we get to understand the meaning of those that attach themselves to De Gaulle. Okay, and then from Jean Luc Mélenchon we understand the left, some of the left, yeah. And uh, from Marine Le Pen, we understand uh, what in France is called the extreme right, although <laughs> they don't look extreme anymore. You know, the left uh, is not so much left anymore, and the, the right uh, is, is trying to move to the centre. It's all uh, in a state of uh, flux, yeah. looks like to me anyway. Yeah. Some people say, this is really interesting, that after um, Sarkozy, Hollande, Macron and the United States influence in France, that the thousand-year state, France, is beginning to end and Richelieu's creation of a France without powerful regions and central administration from Paris is nearing the end. And the regions, for example, uh, Brittany and then Normandy, will begin to reassert themselves. They will be, take some strength from the centre, you know, because everything is Paris. France is Paris, you know, but that's what some people speculate that Richelieu 
Richelieu and Louis XIV creation has begun to end. But not France, you know, is ending, but the way, yeah, the way uh, Richelieu brought every, all of the aristocrats to Versailles and then took over, you know, the regions for central administration. I read that, that maybe that's coming to an end. Imperial France, you know, is coming to an end. That's what I read. I'm not saying that this is true. What does that mean for the fight for Julian? What does that mean? I, I, I don't... Uh, there's all, you know, con conversational speculation, so we're allowed to say anything, you know, we can say anything. Up is down and down is up. But uh, uh, to be serious, what does it mean for the fight for Julian? Well, in some ways, it means that the determination of Julian's fate rests entirely in Washington. The French no longer has the power to assert itself particularly over its own interests. That's in some ways what it means. You know? it, uh, other ways it could be that the circumstances uh, that France and Europe faces with the looking like 20 years of decline ahead, that France will be reinvigorated and they'll see, oh, well, listen, we have some problems to attend to. And uh, it's better that, uh, that uh, Jean-Luc doesn't fight all the time with uh, Mimi Le Pen. It's better. Maybe we can organise some political, ideological, doctrinal approach to the renewal of the France. Maybe that's what it means, you know. I don't know. The future, uh, the, the predictions, particularly about the future, are very difficult. How can we support without being dependent on political organization, not to give up, not to let them help? completely power to change things? Well, uh, from, from my point of view, is the Logos, you know, is the answer. They're just word. They control the word. Well, we take control of the word. And then, this, uh, also there's a good thing in the Bible, which says that where three people or more are gathered together in my name, I will be there. Which is an allegory for truth. So if we gather together and speak to each other, we will be able to conjure up through the sacred process of conversation and hospitality, the truth. And funny thing about people is that when they find the truth, they act. Would you talk more about truth and freedom? Yes. Well, my, my formula, you know, <laughs> that is, is that I operate under is that um, every time you get close to the truth, you get closer to freedom. It's, it's not so hard, you know. People like to debate or make philosophies and so on and so forth. But to keep, to keep it fresh and simple, who was that? 
somebody's razor, Ockham, to keep it William of Ockham razor, the simplest theory that fits is that if you get close to the truth, then you've got another freedom. You've gathered your freedom, well, I'll put it in here, in my heart, I'm keeping it. And another thing, you know, is interesting, is the distinctions between men and women. And there's lots of truths in there. For example, I look at you and I know two things. One is that you have a secret in your heart, which may be somebody some person who you desired and had encountered the feeling of love, but you will never reveal it. And you won't even reveal that what I have just said is true. Would you talk to us about Julian's vision? No, I, 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 he speaks, you know, for himself. I could speak about what Julian envisaged to me with WikiLeaks, but his his own being, I can't address that, you know. That would be, that would be, per, what do you call it, presumptuous, yeah. And more than presumptuous, it would be imperialism, you know. Um, it, his, the way he described WikiLeaks to me was that it would bring information and hold the information on the internet and people would come and look at the information and analyse that information and make discussion amongst themselves and thereby build a body of knowledge. And on that body of knowledge, which is constantly improving, make good decisions for themselves, for their families and for their communities or nations and would be able to contribute to the formulation of policy. For we know this truth, that all genius arises from within the people. It doesn't come down from upstairs, not from the Elysee Palace. It goes up into the Elysee Palace from the people. So the genius of France, you can see when you go to the cheese shop or the charcuterie, the fromage, fromage, fromage. Yeah. It's not so hard. Or you can go to the Louvre and see, you know, the what. So you can see clearly what arises from within the people, and as it arises, it separates out into distinction and characteristic. But it arises from the people. Yeah. So we keep that in mind. About domination, I often think about a few words from La Boétie, French writer from the 16th century. They are torn because we are on our knees. You know, we mentioned transparency. We used to, 13 years ago, when 
well, say 2006 when Julian's started WikiLeaks. There are even in universities establishing schools of transparencies, and there are lots of uh, people speaking about transparency in government. It wasn't really new because, uh, you know, in 1850s people were speaking similarly. Uh, but what has happened is amazing that now government and institutions, corporations, are resisting transparency with censorship and so on. But people are transparent. The individuals are, have complete transparency now. The, your medical records, your social media records, your bank, in bank account records, your shopping it, is done where you pay rent is done. So we, you're registering your marriage and your children and the inoculation procedures, what they call vaccines and whatever. Uh, and the what was in Australia and I think in Europe too, the uh, Q code that shows where you've been and so on. So transparency for people now is complete, which is upside down. You know, we want some privacy. We don't want, and uh, transparency for government is gone. They have embarked upon censorship. Yeah. So that uh, change is striking. It's now upside down. I give you a word, discernment. Discernment. Um, well, it's important understanding for people to have, you know, to be discerning. Um, to be discerning at the same time to have an open heart, you know. Um, how to love people. They're very difficult to love because they want love to come in their way, particular to them. So discernment is, a, I guess, the avenue with which we approach how to love and embrace people. Destiny. Destiny is fascinating. Yeah, often, you know, people go to the astrologer or, or the fortune teller to have some idea of destiny because it's such a mystery. You know, where, where, what you're destined for. But in the poem, we're all destined for Ithaca. There are many Ithacas in life, you know. But we're all destined to come to Ithaca. But there are so many, many, many who find Ithaca. Well, this is an Ithaca today, you know. This is a, uh, an Ithaca we've come to. You mentioned Prometheus as an allegory. What is really bad? Steal the fire? Or steal the fire to give it to humanity as it hasn't been given? I was using two models. One is Prometheus having the interior strength and love of humankind to give humanity 
fire. You know, you, because when you give away something really special, you have to have a lot inside you. Otherwise, you turn to a shell, into nothing. So he, he, gave, he gave, and the gods were cross with him. So they put him on the rock. Okay. And each day the eagle came and tore out his liver. So he had to suffer in eternity. But the other story is Prometheus unbound. How do you get, how does Prometheus get off the rock? Get the manacle undone, how? Well, through knowledge. So Percy Bysshe Shelley, an English poet, he died at the age of 26. He was a friend of Lord Byron and uh, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. Okay. Frankenstein is Mary's uh, understanding of what technology will do to people. Okay. Shelley wrote uh, Prometheus Unbound. Prometheus always is moving towards freedom from being bound through knowledge. So I was using those two, that is the parallel, you know, the ancient Greek image of generosity and punishment and the enlightenment understanding that knowledge brings you closer to freedom. I just like that contrast. Yeah. Also, I, I could add that there's a, a allegory between Julian bringing knowledge and then the power, the gods, strapping him to a rock and pecking at his liver by smearing, lying, slander, malice. Yeah, so I, I just yeah, I found that attractive understanding. What can we do to support the fight, to give some strength? Well, I keep on coming back to the Logos, you know. Just discuss uh, with your friends. Uh, uh, then you will do something. If you're healthy, most people are, you know. If you're unhealthy, you just talk and go to bed, you know. Sleep for three months. Ithaca has been screened in US. How did the audience react? They cry. Not only in the US. They cry. They, uh, they, they say, what can we do? What can we do? I mean, if you've seen the movie, you've already done something. Yeah. Yes. Already you've done something just by watching the film. I, I, you know, I, I just think uh, if every time you contemplate what can we do, you rob yourself of your own power. You think it's somewhere else. You know, you, by just coming to the conclusion that this is an injustice, you've done yourself a justice. In the Julian Assange Support Committee, we are at his service to the case, to you, is there something we must keep in mind? Well, you know, uh, how does it go to the barricades, mes amis? Again. 
again, yes, again. <laughs> All my life it's been. <laughs> my uh, distinguished guests, my fellow Americans, this is America's day. This is democracy's day. A day of history and hope, of renewal and resolve. What are the common objects we as Americans love that define us as Americans? I think we know. Opportunity, security, liberty, dignity, respect, honor, and yes, the truth. Recent weeks and months have taught us a painful lesson. There is truth and there are lies. Lies told for power and for profit. And each of us has a duty and a responsibility as citizens, as Americans, and especially as leaders, to defend the truth and defeat the lies. Devil. Satan has many voices, huh? Even his very son's coming from nowhere. He's a, he has a very ugly speaking voice. It's sort of uh, from here. It's some, it comes, doesn't come from the throat. It comes from somewhere here, doesn't it? We have truth and lies. It's like that. It comes from here. How can we imagine that political are going to change something when we see that? Uh, yeah, it's very hard to imagine. Yeah. But it, it's already changed. I mean, this is like two years now. Um, things are unrecognizable. You know, there's 400,000 dead men in the last 18 months in Ukraine. One million injured. A whole country has been destroyed. And this joins the list. Where do we start? You know, Afghanistan 22 years ago, and then Iraq destroyed and Yemen destroyed, and Libya destroyed, Syria destroyed, Pakistan ruined. And now Ukraine. These people, they weighed nostril deep through a river of blood. It's horrifying. As I travel the world, you know, round and round, I find that people don't want this. And the institutions of state seem to exist outside of the people that constitute their countries. I never met anybody who wants war, you know, that wasn't a bit of, you know. Anyway, we are getting there. We started uh, some years ago, maybe in 2016. Two people, uh, so me, uh, Peter Wish Wilson, and Andrew Wookie, 
3, 2016. Now there's millions, there's presidents and prime ministers. So we're getting somewhere. There's no need, unless you live in Ukraine, then you must despair, of course. This is your responsibility to despair and then become strong again. But for us, we have to understand where we've come and where our energies are going and our governments. Now, you see Macron, he went to the football the other day, the rugby. The people just boo, boo, go, go. We, we want to watch the rugby. We don't want to watch you ever. Go away. You can be president, but stay in the palace. So this is growing health. Like a newborn baby, you know. You can see it growing. And soon it will have its own personality. What sort of health, or what sort of... that continue, what sort of mind and character this newborn baby that's growing in Europe, in France and Germany and Italy. We will see what sort of thing it is, what sort of being, not thing, being it is. But it is coming. There's a wonderful film by the Swedish director Berkman, and it's about Nazism you know, uh, the coming of Nazi egregore idea. And he's, he's very clever. He calls it the serpent's egg because the membrane of a snake's egg is transparent and you can see the snake inside. Um, but for, uh, you know, for this thing, I, you can see the egg and you can see inside, not a snake, but a duckling, you know, or chicken, you know. They try, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, hmm. It's here. Some people see, others don't. No, you, 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 human beings don't need to see. We, are, we go by feelings. And the feeling, you know... Uh, are you French? Yes. Okay. You're not Chinese? No. There's 1.4 million billion Chinese. I think there's 65 million Frenchmen. How is it that they're all French, these 65 million? There's some idea that binds them together to Frenchness. <laughs> okay. And, but they can't see. They don't read Diderot. They don't read uh, 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 Poincare. They don't, you know, they don't read Voltaire. They don't probably don't even read Alexander Dumas, which is, you know, a good fun story. And yet they're Frenchmen. There's more, you know, like life is not so, so, so uh, I mean, it's elegant and beautiful, but we make it sort of complicated, you know. There's something that binds all of the people together to be French or English. And we look for that. What is it, I wonder? 
and we look for the distinctions. And when you, you see, how is it? This is a good example. Okay, and then I'm going to stop. How is it that 1.4 billion Chinese people can live together and 1.4 billion Indian people, or Bharat now they call it, can live together? What singular characteristic allows that phenomenon? It couldn't happen here. What singular characteristic of those two civilizations, that each civilization has their characteristic? Can you guess? In China, it's harmony. Win win. They practice harmony and they practice the Tao. Do you follow the trail? The Tao is ephemeral, you know. If you say, I've found the Tao, well, you haven't, it's gone. And in India, they practice tolerance. They can tolerate. They can tolerate the intolerable. <laughs> The 3rd of July, we organized a concert to inform about Julian, to support. And to introduce the concert, I read some words written by the anarchist geographer Elisée Reclus that he wrote in the preface of Words of a Rebel from Kopopkin, as he was in jail as a political prisoner. Peter Kropotkin is in prison, cut off from the society of his peers. His sentence is harsh, but the silence imposed on him and the subjects that are most important to him is much more painful. His captivity would be less heavy if he were not gagged. Months, years will perhaps pass before the use of speech will be restored to him and he can resume interrupted conversations with his companions. Life slips away quickly. In exchange, how many banalities will be rehashed to us? How many lying words will come to hurt us? How many self-serving half-truths will ring in our ears? We long to hear one of these sincere and unhesitating languages who boldly proclaim the right. But if the prisoner no longer has the same freedom to converse from the depths of his soul with his companions, at least can these remember their friends and collect the words he once spoke. Among those who, from near or far, observed his life, there is no one who does not respect him, which does not testify to his high intelligence and his heart overflowing with kindness. His crime is to love the poor people and the weak. His crime is to have pleaded their case. Public opinion is unanimous in respecting this man. And yet she is not surprised to see the prison doors obstinately closed on him, as it seems natural that superiority is paid for and that devotion is accompanied by suffering. You will understand his words, but you know in advance that these ideas will not lead you to honours. They will never be rewarded with a position, with a big salary. Perhaps they will rather attract the distrust of your former friends or some brutal blow from above. If you seek righteousness, expect to suffer inequity. Let everyone remain master of themselves. Do not 
turn towards the official pulpits, nor towards the noisy tribune in the vain expectation of a word of freedom. Listen instead to the voices that come from below, should they pass through the bars of a dungeon. Well, the last lines that sort of uh, inhabit my mind as well, where everything comes from below. The story of political prisoners has no timeline. No, no. No. There's no monster colder than the state. <laughs>